So this is lecture 24 on the closed set test. So basically be looking at pages 258 to 262 of the 2020 lecture notes. Um, and so this would be the, the, the closed set method. It's the analog of the closed interval um, test in, uh, in Calculus 1, right? So that, that was for a function, right? from say a b to the reals what did you do you basically look at f of a you calculate f of b and then you calculate f of c where f prime of c is equal to zero right so you look at those three things and um, that's the closed interval method right it tells you the the maxes and mins for a continuous function on a closed interval and um, so we're essentially trying to do the same thing, but for a, 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 a instead of a closed interval, we have a closed set. In fact, a closed bounded uh, subset of R2. Bounded just means that you can put a, a disk around it of sufficiently large size. And if you have a, have a function which is continuous and um, you look at its values from inputs taken from a, a closed and bounded subset of R2, then that uh, will that function will attain a global maximum and a global minimum somewhere in D. This is um, this fun this theorem has a name. It's the extreme value theorem. All right, and um, I say this is the analog of the extreme value theorem given in uh, you know first semester calculus. But um, and again, closed is that that topological. Uh, Term, which means that it's um, essentially it doesn't have fuzzy edges. The edges are are filled in. Um, of course, we've talked about more careful ways of defining that in the other class, and I'll leave it for there. But uh, so the extreme value theorem told us that the maximum mins of a continuous function in a closed interval retain somewhere in A B, and so that that you know motivates essentially the same idea for for a function of two variables is. Um, here I'm just rehashing the uh, closed interval test from Calculus 1. Here's, here's what, it, it, what it motivates us to do for a function of two, for, for more variables, right? If D is a closed and bound sub subset of R2, and we have a function of two variables, then what we're going to do is we're going to look for extreme values on that closed bounded subset by first of all finding any critical points in the interior of D, right? And then we're going to find any extreme values for F on the boundary of D. And then we'll pick winners and losers comparing the values at the critical points in the interior and the extreme values on the edge. And um, that's, that's how you do it. So let's actually look at some examples. Now, uh, it's easy enough for me to talk through an example here. But honestly, folks, like if I do this in class, Real time. This would take any any one of these examples it takes me at least thirty to forty minutes of class time to actually go through the details of. So um, <laughs> be, be not deceived. I'm just going fast here. Um, it, it will take you time to work out these examples. So this is a function x to the fourth plus y to the fourth minus four x y plus one. Let's say find the minimum maximum on the half disk. Um, so the half disk is this guy. So I said x squared plus y squared less than or equal to 4. And I'll stop using that marker. It's too fat. And um, here's y greater than or equal to 0, right? So that puts you up in here. Right, this is the region of interest, and so I say, okay, I'll I'll begin by looking for local mins and local maxes. In other words, I'm looking at the interior. I calculate the gradient, set it equal to zero. <laughs> I end up with x to the ninth equal to x. Interesting, and so you can you can <laughs> solve that by factoring, and you end up with solutions. Yowzers. Oh, that's cool. Anyway, sorry, I digress. Uh, looks like we only get one and minus one as solutions. Oh, and zero. So, and um, 
So, okay, so, uh, but I remember y is equal to x cubed on that, so once I know x is equal to 0, 1, or minus 1, that gives me y is equal to 0, 1, or minus 1 as well, because the cube uh, takes 0 to 0, 1 to 1, and minus 1 to minus 1, as it happens. Um, huh, that's cool. The cube has three fixed points, 0, 1, and minus 1. Hmm. Whoa. Uh, so we've got critical points, this, this, and this, and however, one of our critical points, you know, watch out for this, right? Minus one, minus one, that's, you know, okay, so like zero, zero is here, one, one, maybe that's here, right? Minus one, minus one, down here, it's not an element of the half disk, right? So I'm calling it H, calling this whole thing H. Um... Ah, okay, cool. And moving on here. This isn't really necessary, but I was doing it just to, you know... Technically, you don't need to check the second derivative test, because just like with the closed interval method, you don't need to check the first derivative or the second derivative test. You just, you know, make a list of values and pick winners and losers for the closed uh, interval method. Um, but it is fun to look at it. And if you do look at 0, 0, and 1, 1, you get, you know a saddle for the origin and a, and a local minimum for the other one. But anyway, like I said, logically we do not need the Hessian or the analysis of the table above. I include it here for curiosity alone. It suffices to just calculate the values of the function at those critical points. All right. Next up, the diameter of the half circle boundary, um, in the diameter I mean the, um, this is the diameter, this piece right here. When I say diameter, diameter is a, a line segment that connects one end of the circle to another, right? So this guy right here is that diameter I'm talking about. So the half circle, the, the half disk boundary is formed by a diameter union with that half circle, actually. Um, okay, anyway. Um, so that has y equals to 0 and minus 2 less than x less than 2. And so the easiest thing to do there is just look at the parameterization of the function, which is x to the fourth plus one, using x as a parameter on that edge. And, um, and in fact, we end up using the closed interval test on the diameter because we're looking at g of x equal to x to the fourth plus one on the closed interval minus two to two. And so zero is the only critical number. Actually, we already found that. That's zero, zero again. But you get 17, 1, and 17. All right, great. And so we've got two new candidates, f of minus 2, 0, and f of 2, 0, uh, equal to 17. Those are two new candidates for the maximum on this, on this half disk. Then the half circle, um, I, I can parameterize with 2 cosine t, 2 sine t. And if we look at f of the parameterization, call that h, it gives us this kind of pretty, I mean, well, pretty ugly. 16 sine to the fourth plus cosine to the fourth minus sine cosine. And again, we can, you know, use the closed interval test to calculate the derivative, set the derivative equal to zero. You uh, get this, which has, we either need cosine minus sine equal to zero or sine plus cosine equal to zero or this equal to zero. So that can be converted into a two sine two t. And so we either need tangent t is 1, tangent t is minus 1, or uh, apparently 2t is like uh, two, 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 minus pi over 6, I guess. Um, yeah. And, um, or 7 pi over 6, if you like. So anyway, working through that, so I'm gonna, sorry, got out of frame there. Working through this pesky trigonometry, I get four uh, four times, which are potential um, extremal values for the uh, for h, and it gives me these four points on the um, on the on the half half circle, and when I plug those into the um, to the object to the function we're trying to maximize, the x to the fourth plus. Don't forget, this is the function we're trying to maximize. I got to plug those points into there, and when I do that, blah 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 blah, yeah yeah yeah, I get approximate values of 0.31. 
11.6, uh, 19.0. Ooh, and these 19s are bigger than the 17s we had before. We may have a winner. In fact, I think at this point we can look at everything together and say, okay, so of the nine possible external points, we observe the minimum values minus one, which was attained at one, one. Right, so that critical point we found in, in the, uh, to start with actually matters. It gave us the minimum value. And the maximum value of 19 is attained at this point and also at that point. And uh, here's the graph, which is, this is actually a graph of the uh, function over the half disk. So, there you go. Yep. These are kind of tough. They take a while. They, there's a lot of a lot of moving parts here, a lot to keep track of, but um, there, there it is. That's, that's how I do them. And especially annoying if the um, the edge of the shape you're looking at has, like, corners or something, then you have to break about part the boundary and look at each part, you know, one at a time, unless you got some kind of other workaround, but, so here is a function, um, 1 plus 4x plus minus 5y, this is a linear function, right, and, um, here this is a triangle, right, triangular region, and, um, I labeled that 1, 2, and 3, so the boundary of S has these three line segments given by x equal to 0, y between 0 and 3, or y equal to 0, x between 0 and 2, or this line, y equals minus 3 halves, x plus, plus 3 um, for 0 less than x less than 2. So this, this, these box things tell me how to parameterize these line segments, and then I can just plug these parameterizations into that formula, respectively, to figure out the maximum um, or minimum of this function on each of the line segments, right? And when I do that, um, when I when I when I do, and, and and also I should mention that that's it. That's all there is to look at because the gradient of this function is four minus five, which is non-zero, and so there's no local extreme for this linear function, right? Um, maybe you've had a class in linear programming. This is the kind of thing you do there. If you have a linear objective function, there are no local extremes because the gradient's a constant vector. So the local extremes have to come from the boundary. And when you start working out how that works, essentially for the same reason, the local or ma local maxes and minimums have to happen actually at edges, at not, not just edges, but corner points to the boundary. So it actually suffices to evaluate the function 0, 0, 2, 0, and 3, 0, 3. That will tell us the mins and the maximums of that linear function on this region. You'll start to understand why that's true if you understand the theory here. But um, that's what I'm going through here. So I think this is leg one, leg two, leg three, and when I do that I end up figuring out that there are no critical points in the middle and we only need to check the endpoints and we we get one minus fourteen and um, one and nine, and uh, this one minus fourteen and nine, I guess. So of course we're there's overlap, right? Because one and three and two they share a common vertex, right? But um, anyway, the the outputs at the vertices were one minus fourteen and nine, so minus fourteen is the minimum and nine is the maximum. Yep. So. And, um, of course, that's, that's easy enough to see if you could graph this, the, the objective function over the triangle. You've got this, like, triangular, you know, shape, and, of course, that's the maximum and that's the minimum. It's, it's simple to see if you can see the picture, right? And I, I point out that this generalizes to uh, the high school result of called the, you know, linear programming. And um, if you want to bump this up a notch, then you should study operations research where you'll learn something called the simplex method, where they introduce other things like slack variables to deal with sort of more, yeah, more complicated versions of this problem, essentially. But uh, Here's another, another good problem. Uh, find the absolute extreme values of f. This is my f. 2x cubed plus y to the fourth on the unit disk. All right, so I got to look for the local, local, local interior maximums, minimums, right? Uh, the gradient is this, so I only have to check the origin. Um, the origin is my only critical point, and it, 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 it gives me zero, so that's 
Okay, let's we'll keep that in mind for later. Next, we look at the boundary. Um, the boundary is um, given by y squared equals 1 minus x squared. Um, so, of course, I could... Uh, I could easily just plug that into here and then just this is the function evaluated on the boundary and then I can do calculus 1 on that and I get this I find the critical points of the function uh, you know parameterized on the boundary um, are going to be for 0 for 1 half and for minus 2 um, and let's see here so when I plug those in First of all, minus 2 is not possible for that, right? I can't have 4 plus y squared equal to 1. So minus 2 is actually extraneous to this analysis. But 0 and a half give me this and that set of points. And so then you can plug these points into the, the function we're trying to maximize. And out pops 1 and 13 sixteenths. Of course, 1 is bigger than 13 sixteenths, since 1 is 16 sixteenths. And, um, all right. Uh-oh. A subtle point which matters to this problem. Y is not a differentiable function of x on an open, cent open set centered around x equal plus or minus 1. Notice that the points minus plus or minus 1, 0 on the unit circle, and we obtain f of 1, 0 equal to 2, and f of minus 1, 0 equal to minus 2. Ooh, look at that! Ooh! Yowzers, we got, we, we got, got burnt if we weren't careful about that. So, <laughs> um, in fact, 2 is bigger than 1, isn't it? And um, is 1, 0 on the unit circle? It absolutely is, right? And so what's the, what's the moral of the story here? Is be careful about your parameterizations, right? Here, what, what got us into trouble is that I used y is parameterized in terms of x, right? And, okay, but... And we're also trying to take derivatives, right? So it's not just enough for it to be parameterized. It needs to be parameterized in such a way that it's like smooth. Um, and the thing is there's a vertical tangent in the circle at the, um, you know, 1, 0 and minus 1, 0 for the unit circle. And so those points we get into trouble when we try to parameterize y as a function of x, which is what is implicit within this, this calculus here. So to avoid that, you could use like cosine t, sine t for the parameterization. Or, better yet, you could use the Lagrange multiplier method. Do I not use the Lagrange multiplier method in any of these examples? Err, where's my Lagrange multipliers? Well, I'm annoyed. Uh, well, I say, okay, so to deal with the boundary of D, we could have studied gradient of F is equal to lambda gradient of G. Um, or we could have set X equal to cos and Y equal to sine and, and sought out extreme values for that. Um, but anyway, just to warn you, uh, you need you should be a little bit careful about parameterizing the edge because if you if you have a parameterization which is not differentiable, if there are like artifacts of undifferentiability, if you will, in your parameterization, and then you apply the closed set test for that parameterized uh, through the parameterization plugged into your objective function, you could miss things because where the differentiability breaks down, you're not going to pick it up in your critical analysis necessarily. Yeah. Now, let's see here. If we look through the problems at the end of the chapter, I, I am assuming... Let's see here. I've got a bunch of Lagrange multiplier problems in the solved problems. The soda can... Oh, look! Soda can problem is in the solved problems. Um, that was a... Uh, <laughs> That was a um, problem that appeared in the uh, math battle improperly. Sorry about that, guys. Um, <clears throat> maybe I'll recycle it and bring it back again. It's a soda can. That would be appropriate. Sorry, that was a horrible joke. Um, I mean, recycling is a joke, I guess. But anyway, um, uh, let's see here. Do, 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 do. Uh, so I got a bunch of examples. I'm trying to see if anything sticks out here. Oh, problem 138 is, uh, is, is ugh. Find the minimum, maximum, maximum minimum values for x squared plus y squared minus 1 
on the region bounded by triangles with vertices minus three zero one four and zero minus three. <laughs> There's an easy way to solve this problem without calculus. I'll just say that. <laughs> Um, anyway, I think there's there's a lot of good problems that I've solved at the uh, at the back of the chapter. So just just to remind you that they're there, and um, you know. Anyway, so I hope I've shown you enough. I'm sorry that there was not a Lagrange multiplier paired with the other thing in here. I should fix that when I finally get around to bumping these notes up a notch. But um, I think that's it for the closed set test. And, if I recall correctly, that's it for our study of optimization of functions of several variables. Um, we'll do more in the other course, where we have, you know, um, eigenvalues and such. That'll be a little bit later. Um, but next up, we'll be studying uh, integration of several variables. And um, I think you'll find that that material is very enjoyable and, and also very simple. So, in, in a way... Um, there, there's a part of it which is sort of geometric and annoying, but there's another part of it which is just sort of mechanical. And if, if you're if you're not totally totally rusty on your integration, it shouldn't be too bad. So, anyway, thanks guys.